Tana Blackmore. Now she's been involved in pesticides and their health effects since 1996 and has participated in development and implementation of Auckland Council's weed management policy since 19, uh, 2010 when it was started. She was the founding member of STOP, the Society Targeting the Overuse of Pesticides, formed in 1997. This was in response to Operation Evergreen, the Tussock Moth Aerial Spraying camp Campaign in Auckland's eastern suburbs. Mm. She's also coordinated, compiled and submitted to public health reports of the adverse effects of pesticide spraying. So she'll be sharing her insights, knowledge and solutions, particularly in terms uh, in relation to glyphosate. So, thank you, Hannah. It's um, a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Now, um, Mariel Watts of the Pesticide Action Network was supposed to be here today to talk to you about pesticides. And those of you who know her know she is, she's the top. Um, so she's very sorry she can't be here today. She's basically doing what she's always doing. She's working hard at the international level. She's off somewhere, um, you know, trying to get all this stopped at the international level. Um, so although I'm not a scientist like Meryl, um, but I've worked with her for 20 years and I would basically like to present a different perspective today on the challenges we face in implementing change and a shift away from our over-dependency on toxic chemicals as a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, I would like to illustrate this, as mentioned earlier, with our experience from two different campaigns that we were involved with and still are and the warnings, lessons and signposts to guide us forward. Mm -hmm. But first, <laughs> my experience is as a community researcher, advocate and supporter of people facing or affected by chemicals or poisons used for pests and basically vegetation control. Um, so you can see me as, as, as the elderly librarian who can point you to the right shelves or, as has happened, um, to take in your archives when you've crashed out <laughs> and have to give it all up for the sake of your health and welfare. And this happens to lots of us. And you should basically see my study. A wall of archive material that I keep. Um, in this respect, and this is just for something for everybody, whatever you do in, in what's going to happen from now onwards, do not underestimate the need for physical networks, not just social media, but support, physical support, tea and sympathy, tea and scones. You really need it. Change is hard work. <laughs> right, so I, I very hurriedly did up four basic truths that we have come across in the last 20 years. That one you can read. This is what we get all the time. It's perfectly safe as long as you follow the label. <laughs> Do not believe anyone who tells you there are no alternatives to these pesticides or herbicides or chemicals. I've missed one, haven't I? Okay. Do not believe anyone, especially the chemical companies, who tell you there are no human health effects from using these pesticides or herbicides or chemicals because they've been registered for use by the EPA. And I think Ian and Wayne illustrated that quite nice. But even more important, do not believe anyone who tells you those alternatives cannot be implemented because they are too expensive. And I hopefully will have enough time to disperse with all of those truths, untruths. Right. For those of you who don't know, next month is the 15-year anniversary of the last aerial pesticide drop over Waitapri City, where we are here today. And this was the end of a two-and-a-half-year campaign by the government to eliminate a pest, a moth. So it wasn't the first one. The first one was a tussock moth, which is where I started. I'd only just arrived in New Zealand, and suddenly, to my horror, 
they were proposing to drop pesticides on us. And I said, come on, this is New Zealand, this is clean and green. What would my father say? He's an organic farmer. I don't tell him where I come if this is what they do to us. So we went through the campaign that we basically stopped after five months of spraying. They said we had to have three to five and they would eliminate all of the pests. We took 23 aerial sprays and another 24 ground sprays oh. in five months. Wow. So that one was, but this is the one that has shown us the way for how we were all told inaccuracies, lies. We, the community was amazing. Thousands and thousands of people have been sprayed. Well, in, in here in Waitakere, ultimately 200,000 people were aerially sprayed. But there was always a small core area around the original infestation where there were maybe 15, 20,000 people who received all 77 aerial sprays. Now, these people who lived there they could go away, they could go to the other side of the city, but you'd have to drive through. It wasn't just spraying your house, it was spraying the schools, it was spraying the workplaces. You couldn't get away from it. Some people gave up, some people left. Some people died. Yes, and some people suffered and are still suffering now from what in fact was considered to be the safest pesticide that could be used for human <coughs> you know, for, to prevent human health effects. And in fact, Mariel was on the science panel that determined that back in 1996. If you had to spray a population, this was the safest chemical to use. But there were effects, and there were horrendous effects. This is why we do it, the children. What are we putting these children through? Mm. How many children suffered in this campaign? This is what we did in the end. We initiated a people's inquiry because at the end of all of this, we found the government would not initiate an inquiry into what had happened, what had gone wrong, what the effects were. So we tried, we really tried, and in the end the community decided we would set up our own inquiry. And for some of you, this is perhaps the way to go. I look at the 1080 debate as it is now, and we hear, we heard from um, Wayne this morning, document what is happening. It was only because for the very first time we documented the health effects of the spraying for the painted apple moth. This, this so alarmed the government. Well, admittedly, we had Sir Geoffrey Palmer on our side as well because he determined that this was not a good idea. There were health effects. And this went up as far as the government level because we had done this thing. This is really important for people to do. You document everything. And it gets to the point where it's so overwhelming. They can't ignore it. And for the first time, we also documented the effects on animals <coughs> and the wildlife. And it came pouring in. This was totally unasked for. It was only because people had heard that I had actually done some work on the tussock cloth that they contacted me and said, oh, look, I've been sick. I started documenting them. In the end, after one year, I had 315 health effects reports. 315 people. And that was not the last, the number of people. And so, really, what happened is at the end of all of this, we had, I mean, we had... It was hard work. <laughs> we raised the money. We brought in experts from overseas. We even had the marvelous scientists from the Tussock Moth campaign who basically, at the end, recognized that what we had done in stopping a continuing um, program of aerial spraying 
um, that they were able to prove that their methodologies and the pheromones, a marvellous guy invented, produced a pheromone that, rather the same way as possums, when they tested it in Japan, um, they had, uh, they sort of opened it up and they had it in the car and they had moths <laughs> banging on the windows surrounding the car, they couldn't see anything. So, having done that, it meant we finally had a tool that didn't involve spraying everybody and the environment with a, with a pesticide. And when it came to the painted apple moth, this gentleman offered his help to the government, to the ministry, free, he offered his time for free, to produce a pheromone for the painted apple moth. Um. No, no way. He was turned down and they employed somebody else to do it. And what had happened was this problem that scientists who side with the community, who work for the community, who have the community's interests at heart, get sidelined. Mm -hmm. They lose their jobs. Yep. The funding is no longer agreed. Mm -hmm. They apply for work. Yep. They don't get mm -hmm. it. A lot of stuff went on. Oh, this is actually the launch. We finally got this people's inquiry underway and they heard evidence. We had a, a five-day hearing. Um, we had Waitakere City Council Chambers for free, given to us by the Mayor, and a marvellous support. And it took them another year to produce their report. This was the launch. Let's just look about that. Now, the reason I'm saying that this is such a good thing is that at the end of all of this, there's a big story to tell you here. Um, you can go to the website and you can read the basic bare bones of it, but because of information that's come to hand over the last couple of years, I'm actually doing a review of what happened. Because they've never again sprayed a human population with anything. So we don't know how we managed to achieve this. We had, I think, 29 recommendations came out of the inquiry. The government never implemented any of them. At the same time, a complaint had been made with the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman conducted a four-year investigation, mm -hmm. came to the same conclusions that our inquiry commissioners came to, and what happened to his recommendations? It is almost unheard of, but the Ombudsman, they ignored all of his recommendations. No, they would not implement it. We had, we had the Minister of Biosecurity. No, 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 we won't implement them. So in the end after, in 2009, they get, he gave up. He said there's nothing he can do when the government refuses to implement the recommendations. But, as I said, the one thing that's happened is that they've never done it again. But, and this is a really important point for, you, for everybody, and it's, it applies to the 1080. When I started looking at what had happened, because this spraying still goes on in Canada and the United States, I had a call for help. And, you know, what are they going to do? They're just about to be airly sprayed again. And I did some searching. Not a single one of the scientists and doctors' reports that were done, that were commissioned, authoritative, peer-reviewed, has ever appeared anywhere in the world. It's like it's disappeared. The whole experience that happens completely disappeared. But what was even more alarming was that I then found, this was last year, so less than six months previously, there had been, um, what was the word? All right. Okay, so I came across a report. This is 2017, the end of 2017. And it was a joint, and I'll read this because it's, get the right. And it was a joint report by the New Zealand Forest Owners Association, Scion, and the Ministry for Primary Industries, 
was presenting their findings from a delegation to British Columbia, Canada. This was undertaken because of Forest Owners Association concerns that, quote, MPI has lost its social license to apply this organic pesticide, BTK, from ground or air in urban areas in New Zealand. They considered that it was a serious potential risk to primary production. But the visit was to learn how the Canadian authorities had managed to gain and retain this social license to spray. That one of the main factors was the legislative amendment preventing any appeals to the spray based on human health concerns. So I, this was an alarming, alarming warning to me. You know, we'd be gone all this time, 13 years. And we thought, oh, this is fine. They've learned their lessons. This is not going to happen again. And suddenly, there's this threat. So this is also, I think, where 1080 and things like this, there comes a point where, yes, they do lose their social license to poison animals in this way. Now, all of this is linked. That was, that was a campaign. All this is linked to, this was to do with BTK. This is glyphosate. Now, this is a meeting, nearly three years ago now, at which we were appealing, having presented, it's like Mary Earl said, when they formed the super city here in Auckland in 2010, we had a situation where all the vegetation control on the roadsides was hived off to this new council controlled organization called Auckland Transport. Auckland Transport, as far as they were concerned, they didn't want to bother with all of the legacy non-chemical areas because Auckland has had in places 30 years of non-chemical roadside treatment and this was under threat and so this was when Mary and myself and others set up uh, the weed management advisory and we had submitted non-stop literally non-stop until we, we <sighs> Meryl back in 1997 had written and this was an amazing document I think it's nearly 250 pages long about transitioning from chemicals to non-chemicals and it was adopted went through its process and it was adopted and the whole of Auckland City went non-chemicals there was only during the process of presenting this and passing it there was only one opposition to it guess who from Federated farmers. Oh. <laughs> what does the hell it had to do with streets? I don't know. So from from then until the super city advent in 2010, over a million people had been enjoying non-chemical vegetation control. Basically, 20 years. No, it was not exaggerated. 15 years. So it was suggested. What we immediately submitted to the long-term plan. This was a big new super city. My God, you know, all the work we needed to do. So we submitted that what we should do is adopt Mariel's weed management policy. It had all been done, it was all tested, knew it could work, all the transitioning, how it was done. Oh no, we want to do our own policy. So it was rejected. Years of work yeah. thrown out. So they decided to make a new policy. And so we went through three years of presenting. Everybody was sick to death of us. Every single committee meeting we turned up with evidence about what could be done. <sighs> Didn't get any. Finally, it was, it was ground out until the final committee day. And I was fortunately, I was, I was there and I was present. I wasn't actually presenting, but I was present. And this was right down to the ground. And to my amazement, a senior Auckland officer, Auckland Council officer, asked to speak to the committee and said,
said um, Auckland Transport request that their roadside vegetation control be removed from the weed management policy. <laughs> And there was a second one, <laughs> basically. Any health effects had to be empirically proven before they could be considered as, a, as an effect of glass. Fortunately, that was rejected. So the policy was adopted. Auckland Transport fought back. And this, until it came to this, 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 this policy here, because I had discovered <laughs> that there had been a uh, committee set up to implement the policy and they go through all this this amazing this amazing policy that that basically said uh, chemicals were a method of last resort and the recommendation was that Auckland transport that all roadside vegetation control should be by chemical glyphosate across the region what but that doesn't comply with well of course they didn't want to comply with the policy anyway. So it just went back and forth through one committee to another committee until finally we'd had enough. And there were several demonstrations, and yes, and I was a part of them. And I think, Trisha, where are you, Trisha? She was there with me, we were holding the banners up. Yeah, yeah, holding the banners up, saying we don't want this. We shut the meeting down, and finally the mayor said, all right then, come back to another committee. So we came back to this committee and he said he was going to relook at the policy. What? We were going to have to go back to square one? No way. No way. So, um, <laughs> through one way and another, we had this amazing meeting on this day, 1st of September, and this is a good. These are the children who came who actually read their own poem out to the committee. We had five, six, seven presentations. And at the end of it, it was agreed, well, basically, that there would be a moratorium on glyphosate. Ah, oh, but hold on a minute, the officer said, you can't do that, you cannot commit an incoming council, this was an election year, to spending all this money. But what they decided to do was they decided to express their support to the incoming council that glyphosate should be removed from the streets, that we should move to uh, non-chemical across the city. That's three years ago. Mm. Where are we now? Same Nowhere. We're still here. We're still stuck. Doesn't matter how many experts we bring before the council. <coughs> Doesn't matter that Muriel, on the day that the IAC report was released, sat there in front of council and said, this is a game changer. Basically, what we were told was, well, no, we're terribly sorry, but um, the EPA has, New Zealand EPA, has approved it, and therefore we can't go against the EPA. <laughs> I'm telling you all this because this is, this is, this is what you're up against. Um, so that's where we are today. Now, this is the bad. This is Waiheke. Yeah. It's a rural area. We've been using non-chemical methodologies in Waiheke for 30 years. Perfectly safely, perfectly economically. What's the matter with everybody who says you can't do this? This was the contractor who came in. Auckland Transport contractor took over the policy, um, took over the thing. First thing they do, they went out and sprayed with Roundup. It took us a long time to sort that out. That's the other thing. Mm. This is a delightful cartoon that accompanied a Chris Wheeler story back in Devonport before we introduced, um, you know, the the, the non the non toxic policy there. It's a t-shirt. <laughs> I know it's, a, it's great, but that's that's what it was like. It was the Monsantos going and having cups of tea with council officers talking about how we can do. We spread. This, because this is what I really do need to touch on, the cost, do not believe anyone who say you cannot afford it. This is an absolute and utter nonsense that particularly Auckland Transport has tried to conceal for years and years and years. This is a, this is a really poor graph, there's no, I don't know what you call them. But anyway, this 
this is the comparison of the cots glyphosate, fatty acids, hot water, steam. Forget about the, the tons of CO, the cost. 700% more expensive than glyphosate. What rubbish! And yet that was being put out everywhere. It wasn't until years later under OIA that I got the answer. Look at this. This is the costing variations from December 91 to 2015. And that's the increased cost of doing non-chemical over glyphosate. Oh, look, 22%, 1%, 47, 12, 2, 8, until you get down to 2012. This is Auckland Transport. <laughs> this is their thing, and from then onwards. But they have tried to keep it all quiet. And the fact of the matter is, is that, that this is just, it is not true. Now, if you want to read all about this and the things that have gone on, please read this. If you, if you, if you go online to the Weed Management Advisory, you can download a copy of this, and it just details in excruciating terms. In that, believe it or not, when, when, forgive me on this one, when in 1994 they wanted to go non-chemical in several um, boroughs in Auckland City, they brought in the first of the hot water machines. And they were highly successful. And the cost was, I think if I was correct, between, I think it was on average about 20% uh, more expensive than glyphosate. Over the next two years, that margin increased 200% more expensive. Not because the hot water was expensive, but because as soon as the chemical companies found out, they went back into the contractor and said, oh, we'll give you the glyphosate for half price. And that's what happens. That's, 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 that's just one. And finally, do you want this? No. <laughs> Or this. Yes. These are real pictures of two sides of Nola Road. One mm -hmm. is under non chemical, <laughs> and the other one is sprayed. The, this is what they do. No spray register? Oh, yes, of course there's a no spray. Yes, but, but that's a nonsense. I, uh, you know, if you're on a no spray register, right, they don't spray your house, but they spray the next house and the next house. You can't, that's right. So, so this is the situation. And just very quickly, because I do have material, people want to buy some books, I've got some of those books. But, finally, <laughs> sorry guys, um, is this question of cost. Today, here in New Zealand, we have technology that is no more expensive than glyphosate. Not just to do urban roadsides and parks and hard surfaces, but rural roadsides. You know, we've got companies now who do hot water, companies who do saturated steam. We've got companies now who do um, hot foam products, which is basically hot water, but with a foam blanket to hold the heat in, which means it kills it quicker and longer. So please, <laughs> uh, sorry, it's, 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 it's rather like everybody. You could go on for another, uh, you know, another 10 hours. But please, just have hope. Because keep at it if you have to, but document everything. And good luck. Thank you. <laughs>